So the Apostle Paul wrote many letters. And he spent a great deal of time in these letters trying to help us understand, or the, the receivers of his letters understand, what love is, what love isn't, and how to use it. And our scripture today is that kind of scripture. What love is, what love isn't, and how to use it. Scripture reading this evening is from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 9 through 21, and we're reading from the Common English Bible. Love should be shown without pretending. Hate evil and hold on to what is good. Love each other like the members of your family. Be the best at showing honor to each other. Don't hesitate to be enthusiastic. Be on fire in the spirit as you serve the Lord. Be happy in your hope. Stand your ground when you're in trouble and devote yourselves to prayer. Contribute to the needs of God's people and welcome strangers into your home. Bless people who harass you. Bless and don't curse them. Bless people with those who are happy and cry with those who are crying. Consider everyone as equal and don't think that you're better than anyone else. Instead, associate with people who have no status don't think that you're so smart. Don't pay back anyone for their evil actions with evil actions, but show respect for what everyone else believes is good. If possible, to the best of your ability, live at peace with all people. Don't try to get revenge for yourselves, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. It is written, revenge belongs to me. I will pay it back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. By doing this, you will pile burning coals of fire upon his head. Don't be defeated by evil, but defeat evil with good. The word of God for the people of God. Do you know what a spiritual director is? Do you know what a spiritual director is? I don't see many people nodding their heads. A couple. I would assume that maybe one or two of you have probably seen a spiritual director before. Maybe some of you are seeing one now. It's not something we talk a lot about in the United Methodist Church, but a spiritual director is someone who sits with you usually once a month for an hour and listens to you while you talk about what's going on in your life. And no, it's not counseling, and no, it's not therapy. The first couple times you meet with them or when you first start meeting with a spiritual director, you might actually meet every other week because they, get, they need to get to know who you are. They need some history. They need to know uh, about your relationships. They need to know kind of where you're at, kind of get a basic outline on who you are. And after that, you're meeting with them and just talking about what's top of mind, what's happening in your life. A spiritual director will help you to, ideally, discern where God is moving in your life, discern where, where God is calling you. They never tell you. If you have a spiritual director say, well, I was talking to God, and God said he wants you to do this, and you just run. You run, run, run away, because that's not what a spiritual director is. The answers aren't inside the spiritual director. They're inside of you. But a spiritual director will listen to you, and over a period of time, as they get to know you, what they will be able to do is begin to recognize patterns, patterns in your behavior, maybe uh, good patterns, maybe destructive patterns. They'll pick up on things you said a while back that don't mesh with what you're saying now. And a good spiritual, spiritual director will say something like, um, what you just said about ABC, how does that relate to what you said three months ago, DEF? And they don't tell you. They don't tell you, but they let you sit with it and try and figure it out. Because clearly they see some connection. It's a really wonderful experience. I have had three different spiritual directors in the last three years. My first spiritual director was suggested to me by our former senior pastor. She, and most spiritual directors actually are Catholic. The vast majority of them are. There are good Protestant uh, spiritual directors, but they're far and few between. I, what I mean is there aren't very many of them. There are certain things the Catholic Church does really, really well, and spiritual direction is one of them. Spiritual directors in the Catholic Church first have to understand that they have the gift, the spiritual gift of spiritual guidance, and then there's a, quite a bit of training on top of that. 
If you're ever interested in a spiritual director, talk to me and I'll help you find one. But I have met with two uh, Catholic sisters and a priest, and every one of them has shared with me and helped me figure out things and discover things about myself that I will always be thankful for. Right now I'm meeting with a sister who is in Webster Groves, and she's outstanding. But at the time I was meeting with the priest, and some of you may know him, Reverend Tom Santon is the senior pastor at St. Joseph's Parish in Manchester. He's a wonderful man. He's very progressive and um, was very practical in his spiritual direction with me. I thoroughly enjoyed it. At the time that I was seeing him as a spiritual director, I was a lay person here, and I was in leadership, but I was fairly new in leadership. And I've shared with you before, I found my faith as an adult. So this was all pretty new to me. And I was really, really naive about the church. I mean, I just really figured that everybody in the church was really, really holy. Particularly if you're a lay person in leadership, you must be really, really holy. And surely the staff is all really, really holy, you know? At, rather than being really, really human, you know, you need to let people be really human. But, but I was very naive. And um, at the time that I was seeing uh, Tom Santon, I was... Uh, lay leader. I was associate lay leader. I was appointed associate lay leader. So things were expected of me. And when I would go in and talk to him, very often what was top of mind was stuff that was going on here. And at that time, because I was a lay leader, I was in some meetings and doing some things that I wouldn't have normally been doing. And I was regularly going to a meeting where there was a, a leader of that ministry that really had a very, very difficult personality, very difficult personality. This person was um, a, a get things done kind of person, a take charge kind of person, but also had a very, very controlling nature. And we would get into these meetings and they would get very, very tense because people would feel that their ideas were being dismissed and they felt that way because they were. <laughs> they were being dismissed. And Feelings were hurt, and the whole thing was really counterproductive. So I, in all my, I, I'm so naive, I'm thinking, how could a church like this have someone like that in a position of leadership? And I'm talking to Tom Santon about this. I'm like, ah, this is awful. And he said, so, as a lay leader, what are you going to do about it? I said, what? He said, you said you're an associate lay leader. He said, what's your role in this? What are you going to do about it? I didn't know. He said, don't you think that maybe your job might be just to get in the way? <laughs> what? And he said, to get in the way. We were sitting at a round table across from each other, and he stood up. Now, if you know Tom, he is a tall, big man. And he got up, and he said, to get in the way. He said, with kindness and love in your heart and always a smile, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And I thought, what is he doing? Well, he didn't mean to literally get in her, his, her, his, her way physically, physically. But what he was alluding to was to get in this person's way within the meeting, to redirect what was happening in the meeting. And he shared with me there are ways to do this, because I thought, I'm not leading. How can I do that? There are ways to do this. There are ways to redirect a meeting without the leader ever feeling undermined. He said the whole tenor of the meeting will change, and even the leader will learn something from it. We talked about it further, and it was, it was fascinating. It was practical, and it was fascinating. His point was you don't fight fire with fire. You don't meet anger and frustration with anger and frustration. Well, he was right, because that's what was happening in that meeting already. Right? I mean, if someone is curt with you, what's your natural reaction? is to be curt right back. You defend yourself. His point is to make a difference, to make a change, you've got to check your ego first and do things differently. And then he gave me another example. It wasn't the same day. It would have been too much to take in in one day. But I was, all, I was having another issue. Somebody was angry with me about something. Somebody was upset with me about something, and I didn't understand why, and it was really bothering me. And he said, you know, there are times I get done with mass, and I'm in my office, and I'm feeling good about things. 
Somebody will show up in my doorway with this look on their face, and they'll say, Father, that's the worst homily I've ever heard. And he'll say, ooh, my natural reaction is just to defend myself because I know how hard I worked on that. He said, but if I can invite my tongue and not do that, and instead, with kindness and love in my heart and a smile, always a smile, invite them in and say, have a seat. I would love to hear your thoughts and sit down with them. He said, they start to talk. Well, they start off talking about the homily. He said, but pretty soon they're on to something else. And they might start to slow down, and I just indicate to them, please, go on. I'm interested. And they just keep talking, and it moves on to something else. And they might start to slow down. He says, you just indicate you're still interested. You're still listening. And you are. And they move on, and they move on, and they finally get to the end of whatever it is they have to say. And he says, you know what we find out usually? What's going on? What's got them upset? Has nothing to do with my homily usually has nothing to do with me, and often has nothing to do with the church. There is something going on in their lives that is very, very painful. And they had to start there to get to there. And his point is this. He said, if I had, the moment that person walked in, defended myself, which is the natural reaction, that healing moment would have never taken place. The conversation would have been over right then. And again... He was right, and it was fascinating, and I've been able to use that a number of times. You don't fight fire with fire. You don't meet anger and frustration with anger and frustration. It absolutely doesn't work. You don't defeat evil with evil. You defeat evil with good. And there really are ways to diffuse difficult situations by doing the genuinely loving thing. But to do this, we really do have to be able to check our ego, and that is really, really hard to do, especially if we're feeling offended or annoyed or personally attacked. That's really difficult, but we, we can do it. We can do it. We have to do it. We are absolutely called to do this. We will be challenged throughout our lives to do the genuinely loving thing when we don't feel like it, often especially when we don't feel like it. And we need to do it anyway, because that is what we're called to do. We check our ego, and we put others before ourselves. That's what we're called to do, and it's hard. In our scripture, we read, Bless people who harass you, bless and don't curse them. Be happy with those who are happy, and cry with those who are crying. Consider everyone is equal, and don't think that you're better than anyone else. Instead, associate with people who have no status. Don't think that you're so smart. Don't pay back anyone their evil actions with evil actions, but show respect for what everyone else believes is good. Oh, such a tall order. Such a hard thing to do. But the directions are very, very clear. <coughs> and, you know, it's one thing to, to discuss this scripture in the light of a fussy, grumpy, offensive person in our life, someone whose actions or words are less than genuinely loving. But how do we look at this scripture without looking at all that has happened in Ferguson? I mean, that takes this scripture and it puts it on a whole different level, doesn't it? I mean, it takes tremendous courage on all sides of this issue to be able to do what is said in this scripture, to live this out. We know, we've seen, we've read, social media, it's been all over the place. It's obvious that there are reckless and dangerous people on all sides of this issue. But what we also recognize is that there, there are far, far more good people on all sides of this issue. Our scripture reads, if possible, to the best of your ability, live at peace with all people. See, it's one thing to be asked to genuinely love when you're genuinely annoyed or genuinely offended, but it's another to be asked to genuinely love when you're genuinely afraid. When you're genuinely afraid for yourself or for your family, and I'm talking on all sides of this issue. No one wants to be afraid. No one ever wants to be afraid. Everyone wants to feel secure and strong and in charge and in control of their lives. 
So what do we do when we're afraid? Well, in the St. Louis area, apparently many of us go to the gun store. Owner Steve King from Metro Shooting Supplies in North County told the Washington Post by phone. Historically, in August, it's very slow because people are getting ready to go back to school, but not this August. Since the 11th, we have made the same amount of money in a week as we did the entire month of July. It's unbelievable. It's four times, five times the volume, King said. When you're posed with losing your life, you buy more guns. Well, some do. Others go to God. Others go to God in prayer. Others go to God in scripture. Others go to God for answers. Others gather in community and as the church to try and work together in peace for the greater purpose. And we have seen the church, not just Manchester, but the church at large, have such an amazing presence in the peaceful side of what's happened in Ferguson and in the desire to talk about and converse about and make a difference for Christ in the world. Our scripture reads, don't try to get revenge for yourselves, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. It is written, revenge belongs to me. I will pay it back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. By doing this, you will pile burning coals of fire upon his head. Now, I do not want you to take that literally. After all this genuine love talk, we are not going to burn people's scalp. That's not what this is about. What this is about is when you meet evil with genuine love, you shock people. You shock people. And sometimes it brings about real change. In the St. Louis Business Journal, there was an article by Jeanette Cooperman that just fits what we're talking about. Ferguson resident Cynthia Broadway went to the protests every day the week after Michael Brown was shot by a white police officer. On August 15th, she stood talking with another African-American woman. I've just never trusted white people, Broadway said. A minute later, a white protester, Tracy Fortenberry, joined them. Broadway was cordial, a little distant. She asked Fortenberry why she had come. Fortenberry responded, because we have to stop the killing of young black men. Broadway replied, well, now, you've put me to shame. If you can come here with us, I can change my views. Later, Broadway said, I genuinely never thought white people cared that much about us. I always thought white people looked down at us, thought we didn't want to work and weren't good enough, no matter how, how much we dressed up. I guess I've kind of built up not a dislike, but a standoff type of thing because the city is so divided. North is black and south and west are white. I really don't interact with white people unless it's business. I've grown up like this my entire life. She's grown up like this her entire life. And in this one interaction, what happens? Well now, you put me to shame. If you can come here with us, I can change my views. How courageous and genuinely loving is that? Don't be defeated by evil, but defeat evil with good. We will be challenged for the rest of our lives, and often on a daily basis, to do the loving thing when we don't feel like it. Maybe especially when we don't feel like it. And sometimes we may find the most genuinely loving thing we can do is to have the courage to change our views. Thanks be to God. Amen.